Hello everyone, welcome to my uh, tutorial about networks. I plan on doing this once a week, kind of recapping everything that I learned in class and reteaching it to you guys for no money. So let's get started about networks. Now when you think, what is a network? Um, the easiest way to respond to that would be basically it's a bunch of uh, end systems or things linked together. So social networking, like Facebook, you would be considered a node or an end system or whatever, and the friends that you have are the connections. So through networking on Facebook, you have a way of reaching everyone in the world. Well, anyone who's on, everyone who's on Facebook for that matter. So the way it works is we have an end system that might be connected to an end system which connects to someone else and like this person's connected and right here it kind of looks like a spider web almost my poor drawing of a spider web but let's start with well, what, what is an end system or a host end systems or hosts are devices that connect to the internet like your computer which you are watching this video on. It could also be your telephone. Yeah, I know this is a very old school looking phone, but it's what I'm going to be, be using. And that's just my computer. So, now then. The uh, communication links, so comm links, are wires that uh, that connect devices to each other. So these could be copper wires. These could be the fiber optic wires that you hear so much about. This could be like radio waves for like Wi-Fi. And those kinds of transfers. Another term you'll be hearing is packet switches. Basically those are switches which are like nodes that basically hear something and then forward it. Kind of like a, a game of telephone except these are much better at keeping the fidelity. Because messages over a longer distance will start to lose power and become weaker. So if we are trying to send if we're trying to send a message from here all the way to here so we send out a message but halfway through it's gotten so weak it won't be able to make it so what we're gonna need is something in the middle basically someone to listen to a packet so it comes here and this shouts it out again like it had just been sent so when it gets here the message is intact. It's, if you think of back in the old days before like phones and stuff, back you know like on the water where like people are using flags and like lights and stuff, in order to tran like transmit messages long distance they'd have like a series of people along the line and one person would send up the flags to one person who would then send up the flags to the next person and so on and so forth until it reaches the person it was intended to reach. So these are what packet switches are. They're usually routers or switches. We'll, we'll get more into that later. Another thing you'll be hearing about, especially when chopping around for routers and stuff, is transmission rate. That's essentially how many bits of data can be, can be moved along per second. So it's bit per second, the data transfer rate. Packets. You may you heard me talking about packets and stuff earlier. Basically, that's just chunks of data. So, let's say you've got a document that you want to send over the internet. The computer then turns this into a packet and sends it on its way. This packet has several pieces of information, where it came from, where it's going to. Basically, it's a letter, which is why I drew an envelope. 
Next, route or path. That's pretty self-explanatory. A route is basically what, like, the way your document is going to take in order to get to the destination. The, there's so many different routes, and your packets travel along these lines, these, these communication links to various routers and switches, who then pass it along to the next one and the next one until it finally reaches. The route, or the path, is, is the journey that this package takes from the beginning to the end. ISP. Now, you'll be hearing a lot of abbreviations when looking into computers. That's because the names are so long. And the way we shorten them up is give them these cool, like, uh, these nicknames, these these things. It also helps us look impressive, you know, for the girls and for your boss when he asks, how the heck did you fix my computer? Well, I just uh, uh, fixed the ISP and uh, dumped the data package router memory default. Yeah. You know, if you, if you can't dazzle them with intellect, Baffle them with bullshit. But anyway, ISP stands for Internet Service Provider. Give me a second. So, ISP is equal to Internet Sir Service Provider. I probably spelled that wrong, but who cares? Ha ha! Or providers. There we go. That looks better. These are people like Saskatel, Shaw, Rogers. Basically, whoever you get your internet from, that is your internet service provider because they are providing you with internet service. Protocols. You may hear about those when like the news is trying to like talk about like hackers, like, oh, there's like these protocols in place, yada, yada, yada. Protocols are essentially the controls for sending and receiving info from the internet. So, when you want a website, your computer must ask a certain way. Otherwise, the, the internet won't understand. Basically, the switches won't understand. Because let, let's, let's say you're sending a letter, and... Uh, that's that's one side this is the other you need like your stamp and all your like info here what would happen if you put your stamp upside down and like curved like this and you put some of the info here some of the info here some of the info there the post office is gonna have a hard time reading this or what if you start using abbreviations or code language the post office won't be able to read that at all, and they won't send it. The same thing happens with the internet. Basically, there's a certain way of doing things. You say w the packets have a certain way of telling where to send this to, where it's come from, how big it is, what the all sorts of things. TCP, the Transmission Control Protocol. And IP, Internet Protocol, are two of kind of the more well-known protocols that the Internet runs on. Your IP. What is your IP address? Internet Protocol address. It's that long string of numbers. The IP specifies the format of the packets. So IP basically has set the bar for how the packets are supposed to look. Internet standards. Basically, this is the standard for the internet. The standard is what the protocols must be capable of. So let's let's say you're you're going to go from one place to another, but this is blocked off here. There there's construction or there's there's something here. So basically says, 
how, how am I going to format the package here in order to get here, just in case? Now, let's, let's say the packets are of undetermined size, and, you know, the Internet's having problems with undetermined sizes because it's, it's got, like, larger packets and smaller packets, and it's waiting for more of the small packets to show up, and the large packets are getting lost. And it basically cleans it up so that more information can come through. It, it sets the bar. That is what an Internet standard is. RFCs, Request for Comments, is the Internet Standards documents made by the Internet Engineering Task Force, the IETF. Basically, this is the, this is the suggestion box for the Internet. So basically, if stuff's not working, the comments made, the Internet Engineering Task Force looks into fixing it, fixes it, and applies the change across the Internet. So again, we said earlier what the internet was, but let's let's get into it a, a little bit more. What is the internet? Yes, it's the thing that gets you Facebook and Google and all that stuff, but really, what is the internet? The internet is actually a network of networks. So, a network of computers here, in uh, in building X, will be able to talk to. A much larger company, company Y, by networking up with them. This is a network, and this is a network. So this is internetwork communications, the internet communications. This happens over a large scale because there's there's more companies, and then all these companies are within a certain region, which are in a certain country, which are in a certain continent. And it gets more and more. So everyone's hooked up to this one big, gigantic network. The internet provides infrastructure. That, and it prov this infrastructure provides a service to apps. So an app like Amazon. So, uh, maybe not Amazon, but a lot of your, your games. A lot of games on your like iPhones and stuff. We'll connect up to the internet to like save your game or like rank you on the, the player boards, you know, that, that really annoying stuff. The internet uses. Okay, well, sorry. Tongue tied and I'm a little thirsty. One second. <clears throat> oh, that's better. Distributed applications are applications that involve multiple end systems. So what that means is we've got our app right here. And let's say this is a chess app. There we go. Chess is a game played with two players. So we need a player on this side on a computer. And we need a player on this side with a computer. So this is a distri distributed application. So chess.com uses the internet to find all these people who play chess on the computer and bring them to one spot. This app is distributed all over the place and links everyone via the internet. Uh, distributed applications exchange data with each other. So basically, if this person makes a move, this person will see it and then will respond. And the chess game continues. Sorry, that, that'll happen. Socket interface. That specifies how a program running on one, in, on one end system asks the internet infrastructure to give it a special, uh, give data to a specific destination program. So basically, the socket interface, I've got my computer and I'm playing chess. The interface with the chess app, basically, this is the socket right here. My data goes into here and the data it generates comes out here. So this is the socket interface. Kind of like your electrical socket. From one side the electricity current comes in and from the other side it goes out. Okay. 
protocols, again, they define the format, order of messages sent and received among the network entities and actions taken on like message transmission and receipt. Again, this is just formatting your letter, whoops, this is just formatting your letter in a way that'll get this deliver this from here to here efficiently and without dropping data. Now let's take a closer look at the network structure. The internet can be thought of as a multi-tiered thing. So what we're going to start talking with are talking with talking about is the edge systems. The network edge. What's on the edge of the network sounds spooky. Actually, it's you. End systems are on the edge of the internet. It's the things that connect into the internet, that access the internet kind of from the outside. So stuff like computers, cell phone, that new Tesla you bought. Yeah, that's fun. Access networks or phys physical media. They're the wired or wireless communication links. So the access networks are those fiber cables, the physical media, the stuff you can actually touch. The network core. So what, what is in that core? What is at the center of the internet? Well, it's actually just a bunch of routers interconnected with each other. There we go. Okay, yeah, there we go, perfectionist. So yeah, this is the core of the internet. This is what it looks like, kind of. It's a bunch of routers connected to each other so that information that came from somewhere within the network contained with this, this node right here can send the data all the way to somewhere within this node. So let's say this is North America over here, and this is Europe. Now, I want to send an email to my sweetie pen pal. I get through all of like, the routers and the path, and I get to here, which then sends it along to the EU place, which then sends it all along and to my sweetie. She reads it, she's happy, and sends it all the way back. The DSL. You may have heard of this at one point. DSL stands for. Uh, let me get my text. DSL stands for Digital Subscriber Line. Basically, these are broadband residential accesses to the internet. So basically, when you get the internet, when you pay for it, you subscribe to whatever phone company or cable company package they're offering, and they run in a DSL cable, like a, a, like a line that'll connect you to the internet. Ah! Dang it. Bandwidth. You may have heard this several times as well, if you've ever been shopping for a router. What is bandwidth? Basically, it's how thick the the it, it's pretty much how thick the uh, the line is, and therefore how much can actually come in and go out. Let's the easiest way to compare this would be a two-lane highway versus one-lane highway. Two cars can go down here at the same time, but only one car can go down here at one time. So this is twice as fast as this. So the more bandwidth you have, oh boy, the more bandwidth you have, the faster your internet is because more data can come in and go out. The digital subscriber line, access multiplexer, basically this is a little box that, or maybe a big box, that they have at a telecommunication office that takes in all of these like internet lines and does stuff with them, sends them off to the correct spot. 
So, for example, if you're getting your internet from your telephone company, well, they don't have a separate line for your telephone and a separate line for your internet. It's all the same line. So this machine will take it and split it. So telephone calls, telephone calls here, and internet here. Yeah, sure, internet. So this gives you all these important phone calls that you need, and this one gives you cat videos and my awesome tutorials. Okay, let's get out of here. Get out of here. Home, a home DSL turns data. Ah, crap! This happened again. Basically, it turns data into high-frequency waves and tones to be transmitted. So, this will turn this into this. Oh dear, hang on. You're, you weren't supposed to see that. Okay, so we'll turn this data into this wave, which will then be sent along the, uh, the line. Yeah, the internet. Um, it then takes this pulse on the mode, basically puts that onto the physical media, your cable, the cable that's in your specific house. Okay, so your home DSL takes the data, turns it into waves, and puts it on the cable that runs into your house. That cable then runs into a larger cable that connects to other people's houses and gives everyone like phone phone calls and stuff. The gigantic cable can actually be split into separate segments. The upper segment is for the like the really high frequency. The 50 kilohertz to 1 megahertz. This is for download. So when you're downloading, like watching videos, requesting pages, you get a whole bunch of like, you get the upper range. Then we've got something a little less. But it's, but it's still kind of high. This is 4 kilohertz to 50. I should probably write this down. So 50 to a thousand. Yeah. Yeah, 50 to 1,000 uh, megahertz or kilohertz for download. 4 to 50 for uploads. So when you're uploading, you're using this part of the cable. And when you're downloading, you're using this part of the cable. So it's not all getting mixed up. And finally, from, from 0 to 4, From 0 hertz to 4 kilohertz is the phone. This, this split section is why we no longer have stuff like the dial-up internet where you had to use your phone to get the tones to use the internet. Now that they've split this up and had the information for downloads on a higher frequency, and the tones for the phone call at a lower frequency, you can do both at the same time. And if you're one, if you're saying, no, the way that's not possible, think of a choir. You've got the sopranos singing exactly the same time as the basses, but you can still hear both independently. They both sound good, and you get both the in, all the information at the same time. Yeah, I should probably... I should probably learn how to do this. Anyway. Ah! Not again. Ah! Okay. One second. Uh. Okay. There we go. Hmm. Actually, 
while I'm at it. Let's just add a new layer just so I can actually just erase stuff. Okay. So cable internet access. It's kind of like the DSL, but except with TV. So DSL. So DSL uses your telephone, your telephone line to give you internet. The cable internet access uses your TV line in order to give you internet. So the same thing that's bringing you, um, keeping up with the Kardashians, is the same thing giving you that vital information for your paper that's due on Friday. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, kind of puts things into perspective, doesn't it? Oh, this is much better. Nope, not, not better at all. Okay. The cable internet access is actually a shared network, so it goes to every house. So when you download something, so let's say this is our main cable, and these are all your houses on the block. So when you download something, this information is actually going to find its way to every single house on your block. So if you're, in, if you're uploading anything naughty, just be aware the sweet old lady next door is actually getting the same stuff delivered to her house, although she probably won't be seeing it it's still going to her house. That's what a shared network is. Everything is on the same line. HFCs are hybrid fiber coax cables. Basically, fiber is the main thing. So fiber optics, the like the light speed stuff, runs here. And you get like a copper coaxial cable running to your house. Uh, now, this isn't fiber, but they actually have gotten some very impressive download and upload speeds on this thing, sometimes almost rivaling that of the fiber optics. So even though it's not exactly fiber, it's nothing to sneeze at. Okay. Now let's take a look at your home network. You'll have your devices, so like your phone, TV, all that stuff. You got your devices, which will connect either through cable or radio waves to your router or your wireless access point. So one of the two. So here we go. Your router is here, but it also doubles as your wireless access point. So everything connects to your router which then connects into your modem, which acts as a splitter. Your modem uses this band for internet and this band for phone calls. Yes, I know it looks like a banana, just ignore it. From the, your modem, you then have an outgoing cable which will find its way to the main cable, which will find its way all the way back to your service provider. So let's take a look at how exactly a more complicated uh, network would look like. An enterprise access network, or an Ethernet. So we have our devices here. Your devices then connect to a switch to a switch or a router or whatever you want to call it. We'll call it an Ethernet switch. This switch also connects to a wireless access point. Which has a bunch of devices connecting to those. Oops. So a bunch of devices are connecting wirelessly to the wireless access point and these wired devices are connecting straight to the Ethernet switch. The Ethernet switch then connects to the router. Well, I'll just do it like this. 
the router also has another Ethernet switch. Because, like I said, it is a network. Everything's connected. And this one happens to be connected to your servers. So, like your mail. So, at work, you'll be on here, and when you request your mail, the request goes here, all the way up to the router, back down to another switch, which then connects to the routers, or routers, the, uh, the servers. Now, th this thing connects to like many, many servers, and, like di different things. The mail is then retrieved, sent back up, and all the way to your computer. In terms of the internet, all the way up and out to the internet. Okay, that is what a more complicated looking uh, network would look like. The kind you'd see at a university or your work or wherever. Now for the wireless LANs. LAN stands for Local Access Network. Kind of like within the building. So, local. Local. Within your building. Okay, a WAN or wide or wide areas area network is a lot larger. Instead of local, as in being like only like a few feet, like ten feet or something like that, uh, the wireless WAN only has an okay bit rate. The WAN, a wide area network, Can go for many many kilometers. These are usually set up by your telephone communication companies. They've got like all these towers which broadcast the signal. This is where you get like the 3G, the 4G, and LTE networks that give you your data on your phone. The host, the host in whatever network will send packets or pieces of data of length L bits. Okay. There Okay, before I get into the transmission, we have to learn that in doing any of this, there's always going to be a bit of delay. Kind of like back in the old days when it would take a while for your letter to get all the way to your friend's house because the post office took their time putting it on trains, planes, and like someone had to deliver it by hand. <clears throat> the same thing happens with the internet. It just happens really, really, really fast. The, uh, the delay can be calculated uh, but we're going to be doing that later, so I'll just let you guys sit in suspense for a while. Or if you don't want to wait, you can just skip to the end of the video. On to the next part. The HFC. All right. Yeah, the hybrid fiber coaxial uses fiber and coaxial cable. Like I said earlier, the big one is fiber, the little one is coaxial cable, which rivals at points the fiber. The mobile access networks use radio waves, which makes sense. They're mobile. You don't want to be tethered to something. A bit propagates between transmitters and receivers. So we got we got a transmitter, so like someone yelling through a megaphone. Over here, we have the receiver. Someone who's listening for that. A bit would just be one piece of information, kind of like a syllable almost. A physical link is what lies between the transmitter and the receiver. If you want to think something like that, remember those like old phones or like like the toy phones, you get like two tin cans and tie a string between them. And then when you talk on this side, the person over here can hear you. 
That's because the sound waves are vibrating along here and vibrating this, which then pushes the air and makes sound for this person to hear. The same thing kind of happens with the internet. The physical link is what lies between, so that would be cables. Guided media are signals that propagate in solid media like any physical wire. So basically those sound waves would be considered a guided media. Unguided media are radio waves. They can go anywhere. So guided media, they're restricted to a line. Unguided media, they can go anywhere within this range. So it can go here, 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 anywhere. Guided media can only go here. This one is great if you're wanting to do a wider network. This one's good if you want to be specific. A twisted pair. They're basically two... F they're basically two... Uh, cables twisted with each other. Uh, something that looks like this. The twisted pair, they're two insulated copper wires. The category 5 is about 100 megabits per second to 1 gigabit per second kind of tr transmission rate. Category 6 is 10 gigabits per second, like these things are no slouches. They can send a lot of data. They're twisted in order to reduce uh, resist or interference from another twisted pair that are nearby because these things are by each other and there's like magnetic fields in between. So you don't want that interfering with your data. So they're twisted in order to reduce that, that, uh, those problems. The UTP is an unshielded twisted pair used for computer networks in a building, so like LANs. Okay. Now, looking on to the different types of media. We've got the coaxial cables, or the things that connect to the, the fiber. They are concentric copper wires, so that we got the TPs here. They're bi-directional, which means they can have data coming and going at the same time. And they're guided because it's a wire. Fiber optic. This is glass carrying light pulses. So kind of like the Morse code where you have one person with the light on and the next second it's off. So this is the information that's carried through here. The on is a, is a 1, the off is a 0. They're extremely high speed because, well, let's face it, it's the speed of freaking light. That's going to be the fastest you can get it to go. <clears throat> There's a very low error rate because of, well, it, it, it's not really degrading much. The light's just carrying. And this is, this is used for long distance for that reason. Because as I said earlier, the further the distance goes, the more a packet degrades. But with fiber, it does not degrade as much. The only downside to this is that it's rather expensive. Like, really, this thing is pricey to put in. Uh, but there are a lot of, a lot and a lot of benefits. Being fast, having a low error rate, and actually it's also immune to electromagnet interference because it's not using electromagnets, it's just using light. So, I mean, that's just another bonus. But like I said, this is pricey. And the next one? We have radio channels. There's no physical wire needed, because radio waves. These things can penetrate walls, 
signals go through walls. They can carry signals for long distance, well, depending on the environment. Because if you go on a road trip and you turn on the radio, you can hear that thing for miles and kilometers. Like you can hear that for a good long time because the radio signals carry. Uh, again, this is depending on the environment and the weather. <clears throat> hmm. Because it is going through the air, so when there's a lot of storms and stuff happening, that can screw stuff up. Um, if there's a bunch of trees, I guess it can penetrate, but part of it bounces off. And again, when it penetrates walls, parts of it bounce off. So if there's reflective barriers and reflective walls, I think like brick is like really reflective, then it won't be able to get through that. Next, we're going to talk about some cool stuff. Satellites. Yeah, we got the... There we go. A satellite, which broadcasts internet. There are 77 low Earth orbit, or LEO, satellites that form a global network. So then we got one here, 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 all around the world. And these things all can link up with each other. So if you're on this side of the world here, wanting to talk to this side of the world right here, you can talk to this yeah, you can talk to this satellite, which will then pass the message around until it gets to a satellite which then beams it down. Uh, these receive a signal and send it yeah, to another satellite or location. They're used to provide coverage in areas without infrastructure. Uh, I believe a couple of years ago Google was having this thing where they're planning on like releasing a bunch of balloons up in the air and like those would provide internet out in like the savanna and like in the ocean so like uh, sunken ships could actually uh, call for help on the internet and would be able to get their message to get through. <clears throat> now there's one other type of satellite and those are the geostationary satellites which hover over a specific location. So an example of this, um, I'm not sure if it's true, but I saw this one action movie, uh, London Has Fallen, and like they're, they're looking for the president, and one person says, well, don't worry, the president doesn't go anywhere without a satellite hovering over him. That would be a geostationary satellite. The satellite follows the president. These would probably be mainly used for embassies, uh, military bases, the president, like important ah, stuff like that. Uh, are we still running? Yes, we are. Okay, so let's take another look at the network core. We briefly, I immediately regret making this. Okay, the network core again. It's just a bunch of like switches that are like interconnected with each other. Packet switching is pretty much a host. Uh, hosts break the application layer messages into packets. So for example, let's say you've got a group of friends. And you all want to go to the movies. Now, okay, let's say you've got 20 friends. Wow. You're popular, and you all want to go see the newest uh, Star Wars movie, but you you really only have like a bunch of like four person cars. Well, that's okay. Four people take one car. Oop. <clears throat> Feedback. Four people take one car. Hey there, welcome back. Uh, sorry, had some technical difficulties happening there. <clears throat> Anyway, like I said, uh, your 20 friends split up into several cars of four people to go to the movies. You can each take different routes and figure out where to go. Now, packet switching basically takes L, 
which is the length of of the packet. Uh, so basically, how how much da data is in the packet divided by r, like the rate, like a bits per seconds. So bits per second, which gives us the uh, the time of resistance. But like I said, I'll be doing the resistance stuff later. So let's. Uh, clear this out. Now for queuing and loss, the more scary part. Incoming data must be queued if a switch is busy with other data. So okay, let's, let's say we've got a bus terminal and we've got people coming in from all over the place. If the bus company is dealing with one bus who is about to leave, everyone is going to have to wait in line. If the line is full, like if there's too many people in the line, like all the lines are full, uh, unlike an actual bus stop, the incoming people will be rejected and will not be permitted access into the bus station and so that data will just be dropped. Um, if however there are algorithms like if this line of people has been waiting for their like last guy who has not shown up in such a long time the bus stop will drop these people and start letting people in in their place but like I said that's a little bit more complicated basically you can think of once the queues are full the the bus stop stops letting people in kinda like a bouncer okay a routing this determines the source destination route taken by the packets. So basically, uh, think of it almost like a border crossing guard. I know I'm using a lot of metaphors, but it's the best way to learn stuff. So we got our border crossing guard. Yes, I know his hat's off. They do that. And we got a traveler coming in. This guy determines where this guy's going to go and sends him on his merry way. A forwarding table is something that's contained in the router. This basically because you're given an IP address. So you remember that really long string of numbers that you never use except for, I don't know, various things? Like it's got like three numbers, a dot, a few more numbers, a dot, two more numbers, a dot, and dot, and dot. Now that's pretty much your address. Now when a packet is sent, the address where it's sent to is going to be on that. So a router will then take this, take a look at the uh, destination, cross-reference it with a table of destinations and addresses, and send it on its correct route towards. A routing protocol that is the thing that sets the table, so this person makes the table. Again, protocols, as I said earlier, they're, they're kind of the thing that like structure the internet. Circuit switching. Data m there are various things in order for data to go somewhere. We did uh, routing and like data switching kind of thing. Circuit switching, basically you must reserve the line before you make the journey. So from here to here, if it needs to go from here to here to here to here, it must uh, reserve a line here, a line here, and a line here before it starts doing the data journey. So if you look at like older TV shows, you'll see like a circuit board operator get a call from someone, pull a plug from one place and stick it in another place and then that person can talk to the other person. That's essentially what's happening here. These routers are, are going to reserve the line, like establish the line, 
reserve it for this communication and then once the entire line has been set up then communication can begin. Frequency division multiplexing or FDM is the line which is divided into numerous frequencies. So it's not just one line, it's like four lines or five lines. Okay? So not so one person won't take up the entire line. There will be several people who can use the line at the same time. Circuit switching uh, can be good for like a safe a safe and reliable connection, but it can be wasteful if the user who requested the who requested this stops like stops doing stuff it becomes idle so for example if you're on the phone and you stop talking yes the, the connection is still yours you're still using the connection but it's not being used for anything it's just being used it's just being used for dead space just silence and that's not really what like a phone call is for you're supposed to be talking so it's wasteful in that sense because yeah like you're using that like how how many times have you been like watching a video and needed to do something go make craft dinner or let the dog out or in or do laundry or run to the washroom you still have the uh the connection um but if if it was using the uh the circuit switching then that all that data, all that time is wasted. Okay? So now, let's move on. So we've reviewed physical media, which we've explained as being the actual physical stuff that's between, like cables and stuff. Coaxial cable is, a, is the stuff that connects to the fiber optics. It's bi-directional, it's concentric, broadband, all that fun stuff. And fiber is the one with the light and the glass. Radio ref is reflected, obstructed by obstacles and interference. But it can go anywhere and it's better used for a wider area. Satellites actually can be considered routers because they just bounce, bounce stuff off. A little bit more of the review. The network core, again, it's just a bunch of routers connected to each other. Packet switching, uh, again, packets deteriorate, deteriorate over long distance, so you have basically something in between to take a silent signal and make it loud again. Queuing delay and loss, if, if all the queues are full, New data will be dropped. Now then, two key network core functions, they've got two different things. We've got routing, which determines the source direction taken by the packets, and forwarding. So basically the router will have data come in, determine where it's going, and then forward it. An alternate Alternative core would be circuit switching. End-to-end, -end, which is reserved and sometimes wasteful. Now, circuit switching actually has a couple of ways of doing this. There's a couple of ways to do circuit switching. There's FDM and TDM. Okay? FDM is basically the uh, the line is broken up by frequencies. So let's let's use highways as an example. Um, cars are only allowed to drive on this lane. Trucks are only allowed to drive on this lane. Vans here and RVs here. It's all reserved. Only cars are allowed on this lane ever. And so I mean. That's one way. If cars ever stop using this lane, then it becomes open for a different type of vehicle like boats or something like that. TDM, we have the entire highway to whoever wants to use it. 
but during certain times. So let's say in this time slot, one, two, three, four, you know, this is into a time slot. So broken up into four. So let's see, 24 divided by four, that's six hours a piece. So this is from like 12 to six, cars can drive. From six to 12, uh, trucks can drive. From 12 to six again, um, vans can drive. And from six to 12, uh, we can have your, um, <clears throat> your RVs drive. Each vehicle can use the entire highway but only for a certain amount of time. So it's, it's kind of a trade-off. Yeah, you can keep this for long, for as long as you want and you're only using part of it or you can use it as much as you can but only for a certain amount of time. So there's a couple different ways of splitting it so that it's it's a little bit more efficient. I mean, time splitting is a way to combat the wastefulness of just being idle for too long. It just stops being your connection, and you'll have to request a new connection. Now then, time to figure out delay. How do delays? There's actually four, four sources of delay. Uh, do you know what? I'm going to use the text for this. We're going to make this nice and big. So the total delay is equal to, as soon as I get my notes here, we've got the D, the, the propagation delay, or sorry, the Processing delay? Hang on. Yes, the processing delay. This is basically uh, checking the document for like errors and determining the output. So basically, something comes in, we're making sure everything's okay, that it's not broken, and we're looking against the table to see where this thing is going. This is under about a, this only takes about a millisecond at most. Actually, usually a millisecond is longer than how long this one takes. Next, we got the delay for the queuing. So basically, this is the amount of time that your data is going to spend in a queue, waiting for other data to show up or waiting to be sent out because you're in the queue. This could take a little bit longer. And it also depends on the congestion. So if this router is like extremely busy, this could take a little bit, this could take long. Next is the tran, oops. The transmission delay. Basically, again, these, uh, these cables won't be instantaneous. They can, they only have so much bandwidth. So you can only send so many bits per second. And depending on how big this packet is, will determine how long it takes. So basically, this, this is where I, hang on, I'm just going to do that here. The transit delay is equal to the length of the data in bits divided by the transmission rate. R, bits per second. So bits divided by bits per second gives us our delay. And our final one, uh, propagation delay. This is the traveling time. Okay, so I, sh I should, I should re uh, kind of backpedal a bit. The back one isn't actually the cables and stuff. The transmission delay is basically going from the switch onto the cable. So basically what you can think of is at the bus going from the line onto the bus. That would be the transmission delay. The propagation delay is the delay 
that it would take to travel. And uh, the propagation delay is equal to V, distance of the physical link. How far exactly is this data traveling divided by the propagation speed in the medium? So basically, how fast is this medium? Is it fiber where it's light speed? Is it copper where it's a, a little slower? Like how good is this copper? All these kinds of things. You add all of these delays up and you get our total delay to figure out how long it's going to take for your data to get from point A all the way to point B. And what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to take this and you're going to have to apply it to however many nodes are in between it. So all of this would be the delay to get to this node. Then you'd have to do it again to get to this node. And this node, this node, this node. So you can see how the time would get longer and longer as the distance increases. And depending on the media in between, it could get even longer. Anyway, that's everything for our first week of, uh, of networks. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you learned something. If you are interested in learning more, subscribe to the channel. I'll be doing one a week. Uh, if you noticed anything in this video that was slightly off, or if I mixed up my words or something like that, leave a comment and let me know. Uh, I'm learning this along with you guys, so feedback is much appreciated. Anyway, I'll leave you at that until next week. I'll be seeing you.